This session explores the potential impact on hospices of the change in the law on assisted dying. And uh, we have uh, a wonderful panel here, but just in thinking about the whole subject of assisted dying, uh, the issue was going to arise at some point, wasn't it? From the end of the Second World War, the nation was looking for change, moving beyond the Victorian era, looking for freedom, looking for flower power, looking for choices about sex and sexuality, and we were going to get round to death at some point or other. Fortunately, I'm not going to talk to you about it. We have some very talented people here who will. Uh, first, we're going to listen to Jo Fernandez, who is a practice development nurse, has worked at St. Thomas's, works at St. Francis Hospice, uh, and is doing a master's in medical ethics and palliative care, specialising and focusing on assisted dying. Then going to listen to Richard Schaefer, who's worked extensively in South Africa and this country as a qualified social worker and consultant in palliative medicine, uh, has chaired Help the, Hospice in, Help the Hospices International uh, and is on the board of Dignity in Dying. Uh, and then thirdly, we're going to hear from Rob George, medical director at St. Christopher's, uh, has been clinical lead of end of life care and palliative care for London, uh, and if you have got the app and read what these wonderful people have done, uh, you will be as impressed as I am. So we'll have the presentations without questions, please, uh, and then we'll have a free-for-all. Sorry, no, we'll have a set of questions at the end, uh, and I will try my best to control it. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Hello everybody. Well, assisted dying, why are we here talking about it today? You all know that on September the 11th, Parliament voted not to change the law. We have upheld a principle in this country that we do not hasten or cause death. So why are we still talking about it? Well, as Tolstoy, as Kipling said, if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is talk to you about some real stories, not, Kim, not Kipling's type of fantasies, but real human stories that have written the history chapter book when it comes to assisted dying. And what I'm going to propose to you is that because this is a story about people's lives, this is not going to go away. So whilst Parliament may, may well have voted for the time being, I'm suggesting to you that we, as hospices, as individuals, we still need to keep at least um, some focus, some discussion about what our personal and our collective moral position is on assisted dying. So there is no change, as I say, society at present is staying very put, but let's continue to talk about this and please don't throw tomatoes at us. I'm not here to tell you what I think, I'm just asking that we all think and we all keep talking. It's difficult to know where to start. Um, I could be here all day, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with some of the high profile cases that I'm going to talk about. But I'm gonna start right back to Tony Bland. Tony Bland, I'm sure a lot of you will remember, was um, at Hillsborough um, in April 1989. He was not one of the 96 who was killed at the Hillsborough football disaster, but he was rendered in persistent vegetative state. He lived um, in an Airedale hospital in that um, persistent vegetative state for the next uh, nearly four years. And it was his parents who eventually said, this is no life. Our son would not have wanted to live like this. He was a 17-year-old boy. He had never expressed any position about, um, about the end of his life. Why would he? He was a 17. But his parents decided that they could bear watching this burdensome life no more. Because he was part of Hillsborough, as you know, we, they, it, had to, it had to go to the courts. Tony had no sentience, but he was in persistent vegetative state, meaning that he was able to breathe spontaneously and his di digestive system was working. 
And as you can see from that photograph, possibly, he was fed via a nasogastric tube. So what happened, and as you'll remember, I'm sure, this went to the highest courts, what happened was it had to be decided how Tony Bland's life could come to an end without contra contravening a law in this country, which is that euthanasia, or hastening death, is illegal. But as you can see, the whole purpose of stopping the nasogastric feeding was to bring about the death of Tony Bland. Well, how could that be in a country where the law is very clear that hastening death or euthanasia is illegal? And this went to the highest court, so the House of Lords then, now known as the Supreme Court, as you know. What the courts finally decided was that it was only in Tony Bland's best interests to be fed when there was some chance of his improvement, of a survival that was about more than living in, in this, this, um, this state. And so, nearly four years later, it was deemed by the courts to uh, remove Tony's um, feeding. There was some question as to whether removing the feeding or purely omitting to feed Tony was different? Would it be morally acceptable just to omit? But they decided that actually that was quite perilous. They had to come up with a decision that didn't contravene the law, but did allow Tony to end his life um, and have a natural death. Some would argue that at that point, the courts ceased to give effect to the sanctity of life in Britain. And it's up for you, it's up to you here to decide whether you agree with that. Did, at that point, was the Rubicon crossed? Up to you to decide. Because if you think about it consequentially, if it's acceptable through case law to bring about Tony's death, then surely an autonomous decision person who judges that his life has irrevocably uh, lost value should have a right to end his life with assistance. Think about it. What do you think? So that was back in 1993, and now I'm suggesting that in 2015 we had the assisted dying bill, but we, knew to, we are still moving on and having these conversations. This timeline, I'm not going to go through every year, don't worry, we'll be here forever. So I'm just going to, as I say, pick out a few cases um, that have been um, particularly well covered in the media. This lady is Diane Pretty. In 2002, she went to the European court to, uh, to secure um, an understanding that nobody would be prosecuted if um, she were to have assistance to end her life. This is a lady who had motor neurone disease. As you know, the courts did not deem that that was a, legit a legitimate request, and she died um, uh, naturally um, uh, the, f the following year. Also in this year, I don't know whether any of you know who this man is, he's Ludwig Minelli. He is the founder of Dignitas. Actually, in 2002, we saw the first Briton going to Dignitas. He was a, a man who did have a terminal illness. Uh, uh, Dignitas was actually founded in 1998, but it was in 2002 that I think Britain started to become um, interested in the whole issue around suicide tourism. Why was it that people were having to go to Switzerland? Was it that Switzerland was now having to do some of this sort of very difficult work that perhaps in Britain we should sort out so that people can access that here? So that's Ludwig Minnelli. 2008, this was an interesting year. That young man was um, Daniel James. He was a rugby player. Daniel James was not terminally ill. He didn't have persistent vegetative state. He was sentient. He had uh, been paralyzed in a rugby match and he had tried to commit suicide twice. His parents took him to Dignitas and that was subsequently reviewed by the Director of Public Prosecutions. His parents had effectively assisted in his suicide, which is, of course, illegal in Great Britain. Likewise, the other photograph there is of Lynn Gilderdale. She was um, a, a young woman who had been suffering from ME. She was very, very debilitated. And she also had a blog um, under the name of Jessie Simmons, I think. She had attracted quite a lot of media attention. 
She likewise had tried to take her own life on numerous occasions, and it was her mother who helped her to commit suicide by giving her a very large dose of morphine. When the Director of Public Prosecutions reviewed both of these cases posthumously, he deemed that actually the parents uh, of Daniel and Lynn had acted purely out of compassion. How could they possibly be prosecuted for helping their loved one who had made a consistent and competent request and indeed attempts to end their own lives but weren't physically capable of doing so without assistance? And so that issue around a compassionate motivation was made very, very clear in 2008. Moving on in 2009, I wonder how many of you saw this film. Julie Walters played the part of Dr. Anne Turner. Dr. Anne Turner had watched her own and cared for her own husband, uh, dying of a neurological condition. And then she, um, I understand, developed the same, the same condition. And she went to Dignitas and, um, and ended her own life. It's a really good, it's a very, very powerful film. Of course, very powerful that this was a medical doctor, yet she deemed that she did not want to suffer. She deemed that she wanted to make an autonomous choice about how she was to die. Moving on, 2009, this is Debbie Purdy. Uh, Debbie Purdy was a lady, again with a neurological condition, this time she had multiple sclerosis. She was a highly articulate lady. She went as far as the highest court in order to secure that her husband would not be prosecuted should he help her go to Dignitas at a time that she wanted to go. Her story was a, a very, her argument was a very compelling one. She said that if I have to get myself to Dignitas, I will have to have upper body strength to do so. I might not be ready to die at that time, but at some point I might, when I will need assistance to get there. So unless this law is at least clarified, it could be that the state in which we are in the UK is denying me some rights to life. On the back of Debbie Purdy, we saw the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions at the time, Keir Starmer, being required to clarify the law on assisted suicide. He, of course, did not change the law. He has no right to change the law. But he clarified under what circumstances people would and wouldn't be prosecuted. Because already, people were asking the question. We've had a lot of these media cases We've had Daniel James, we've had Lynn Gilderdale. We've seemed to have a law that says one thing, but that actually, in practice, isn't happening. Well, how can this be? So, as you know, dear Keir Starmer did clarify the law, and he made it very clear that, again, whilst the law stayed as it, in, its, in its existence, that this issue around compassionate motivation would certainly be taken into consideration for these very extreme and tragic cases. In 2011, this was a very busy year. This was, I've um, chosen to just not show you a clip, but this is a, uh, a film that was on BBC, a documentary that was on BBC Two um, that was made by Terry Pratchett. Um, as you will remember, he was very pro a change um, uh, in the law. Um, he filmed this gentleman, Peter Smedley, who was a hotelier who had motor neurone disease, yet again, motor neurone disease. He filmed him going to Dignitas and taking his life. He wanted to, uh, to portray the importance of this at the same time that the DPP had just clarified the situation. And then in 2012, yet again, this was Tony Nicholson. Tony Nicholson was in locked-in syndrome. He again appealed that he wanted assistance to end his burdensome life. His suffering was unbearable. His wife um, utterly agreed with his decision. It was in 2012 that the Supreme Court did not grant his wish. However, they did suggest that because these cases were coming time and time again, that maybe there was a problem with what um, we have, what our arrangements are at the time being. And in 2014, Jane Nicholson, Tony's um, wife, has continued, uh, continued to argue his case, although 
he, um, he died shortly after, about 10 days after the ruling in 2012. So you can see these cases keep coming thick and fast, and the media really do attract public attention. And that is why all of us are here to think about, well, what, what is it? What do we think about this? What about these individuals who are, who are um, ostensibly asking for their life to, ended, to be ended because they are suffering so much? What do you think about that? This is a photograph of Eddie Redmayne. Eddie Redmayne, of course, in 2013, uh, yes, 2013 played the part um, of Stephen Hawking. But here, Stephen Hawking is quoted as saying, we don't let animals suffer, so why humans? And if you remember from the film, Stephen Hawking's wife, when he was in Paris as a young man, was asked whether his life support machine should be turned off. And his wife, of course, refused for that to happen. And Stephen Hawking has had an immense life uh, subsequently. But he again, Stephen Hawking, living with such profound disability, he feels that provided safeguards are in place, that maybe people's rights to choose to end their lives should be upheld. And Coronation Street. Well, I don't know how many of you watched Coronation Street, but this particular episode last year saw Haley, who was dying of pancreatic cancer, be helped to die uh, with her, I think, husband, Roy. This, was, um, this attracted 10.6 million viewers. It was one of the highest viewing, viewings of Coronation Street of all time. And 100,000 tweets a minute were going off, apparently, when this episode was playing. So this, had, this has really, really heightened people's attention prior to the assisted, suicide, the assisted dying bill. Moving on, Jeffrey Spector. Now, we're just talking a few months here before September the 11th. Jeffrey Spector went to Dignitas. He had a spinal tumour, but was effectively not terminally ill. And I would suggest that his, his plea was slightly different. He wanted his, his, the ending of his life to be high profile. He wanted the media to cover it hugely. But what he said is, this is the best worst. This is better for my family in the long run. He didn't want to be a burden. Some may argue that actually what he was doing was his death was almost that of valour. He was saying, I'm, I'm checking out so that my family don't have to look after me, which I think is a, is a, different, is a, is a different agenda from some of the others who were, who were appealing to the fact that they could not bear their suffering anymore. So the suffering of the individual and now the suffering, the burden for families. In August... 2015, I wonder how many of you will recognize this lady. Her name is Jill Farrow, and she had written many books as a rather eminent nurse, uh, palliative care and care of the elderly. She had written books on how to care for people in their old age and towards the end of their life. But she went to Dignitas because she said, I know what old age is like, and I don't want to be a hobbling, this is her quote, not mine, a hobbling, frail old lady stumbling up the hill. So she went to Dignitas. I understand she wasn't terminally ill. Um, and she was helped by this man who uh, is uh, in the corner of this, the other corner of this slide. His name is Dr. Michael Irwin. Now, he has been around for quite some time. Dr. Michael Irwin is a doctor who actually believes that people should have a right to uh, end their own lives with assistance. And he um, is very vocal on, on, on that point. He believes that this is something that medicine should be doing. I couldn't get much further without mentioning um, Keir Starmer again, the DPP, because the previous DPP, because out of anybody in this debate, this is the man who, in his five years' tenure of the DPP, looked at all 80 cases that hit his desk. Remember, these cases are all posthumous. That may in itself be something that worries you. At present, we only look once somebody has already died. Out of the 80 cases where people were potentially to be prosecuted or had been prosecuted for assisting in another's suicide, he only, up, he only um, prosecuted one 
who was um, somebody who helped a man with suicidal ideation by buying him petrol and a cigarette lighter. <coughs> other the other 79 cases that he reviewed, he deemed that a compassionate approach would be not to prosecute, not to um, um, enact the law. And so we have it. We had on September the 11th two sides of this debate. First of all, it's all right for doctors to cause death. You're better off dead. I'm using provocative language, one chooses one's language, to, uh, to, to choose an argument, to fight an argument. This is about the rights of the individual. The law allows suffering and injustice. So as you know, September the 11th, 330 people, MPs voted against a change in the law, 118 otherwise. And these slides might not come up very well, but actually all I want to show you here, I'm talking about the personal stories. The personal stories really featured very, very heavily both in, P in those MPs who were in favour and those who were against. And you'll see exactly that from this slide. So in favour of a change in the law is the blue sec section and against was, uh, is the green. And I've just got a, a, a couple of... Um, well, one each, for and against, from uh, the transcript of September the 11th. So the first one is from Jim Fitzpatrick. He is a Labour MP, and he uh, voted in favour of a change in the law. And he said, I served in the London Fire Brigade for 23 years, during which time I worked with asbestos. I do not know how many people here have seen the terminal stages of asbestos or mesothelioma. Not only is it not pretty, but it is damned ugly. And if this is what is, is, um, in, lies in store for me, I want to control my own exit. It's pretty powerful stuff. Lynn Brown, also a Labour MP, who voted against a change in the law, she said, My mum died suddenly and unexpectedly, riddled by cancer. But I know that my mum, faced with a terminal prognosis, in a world where there was the possibility of state-assisted suicide, acceptable and accepted by society, would have, been to would have tormented herself during her last months with the question of when she should ask for that button to be pressed. She would have worried about the stresses that my sister and I would have endured. She would have worried about the weight of her care being shouldered by the nurses and the doctors. And she would have been anxious that folk would think that she was consuming too many resources. So very, very powerful arguments. Personal stories are always going to uh, elicit emotion and, uh, and are very persuasive. And so this is Sarah Wooten, who is the chief executive of Dignity in Dying. And after the uh, debate, she said, it's great that we've had the first substantive debate in the House of Commons for almost 20 years. This is an important first step in changing the law for terminally ill people. And again, as I say, this is because this, this, this scenario, these scenarios, these people's stories are going to continue to happen. And therefore, we need to continue to think about, uh, well, you need to continue to think about what you think about it. Just to say um, that uh, Lord Brown Wilkinson, who was one of the law lords uh, at the Tony Bland case, he said back in 1989, or 1993, sorry, he said, if Parliament fails to act, then it will be judge-made law that will continue to be forced um, to, uh, to make decisions uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, some of you may decide that that's okay, that's the way this should be. Other people may wonder about whether that is the right and the safeguarded way to deal with this enormously important ethical issue in our, in our society. And before I finish, um, I'm just going to ask you to think about California. So I've, I've focused very much on the UK deliberately because this is, our, this is our society, this is what's going on for us. But California in October saw um, Jerry Brown, the governor there, uh, signing a, um, a law that was going to, that, it, that now uh, legalizes assisted suicide and assisted dying. I think what's really important and really interesting about this case is that Jerry Brown had originally been very, very anti uh, sanctioning this. But actually, um, what, what swayed it for him was the story of a young woman called Brittany Maynard, who was a Californian who had an uh, astrocytoma, a brain tumour. And she had moved 
with her husband away from her family to live in Oregon so that when she uh, chose to take her own life, when she could bear her suffering no longer, she was in a state where she could do that. And social media being uh, such, such an influential thing, she um, had an enormous following, absolutely huge following. Um, and she was a very persuasive case. And what she said just before she died is she said, I'm not suicidal, I don't want to die, but I am dying and I want to choose how I uh, live my, my last few days and when my last few days will be. Do look her up, actually it's very, it is very compelling stuff and I think it's very compelling stuff irrespective of whether you think that uh, the status quo that we're in right now is okay or otherwise, do look her up, as I say, um, it's powerful stuff. In the UK, uh, since uh, September the 11th, we've also seen um, a 57-year-old man called Simon Binner. Now, he didn't go to Dignitas. He went to another clinic in Switzerland. Um, and he, like Brittany Maynard, has become, he, uh, prior, to, prior to his death, he did quite a lot of stuff on social media, again, to agitate the situation that this is not going to go away. So, where are all of us as health professionals? Well, what are your moral boundaries? Do you consider that we have a principle, that we are here to cure, hopefully, to care always, but never to hasten or to cause death? That may be well what you think. However, you may, you may think that that is why our patients trust us. However, you may consider you may consider that it is an ultimately compassionate act to help somebody else who consistently uh, wants to die to do so. And I'm just going to end with uh, Dame Cicely Saunders, our, the, the, our um, well, for many of us, possibly, hopefully, in the hospice world, um, our, our heroine of ours. She said, I remain committed to helping people find meaning in the end of their lives and not to helping them to an assisted death. It is my hope that the hospice movement will stand firm in this position. You may think that, but you may not. You may consider that the hospice movement is a very dynamic thing and that we are, we, are, we are forced to listen to our public and we are forced to move on. So good luck. Please keep talking. Please keep thinking about these, these dilemmas because they're not going to go away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, that's great to set the scene for us. Uh, as we all know, there's an awful lot of talk on this subject that is ill-informed, uh, and that was uh, extremely informative for this debate. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation to join you here today. I have to tell you that it's a great delight to be retired. It's worth working for. But it is fun to come back to something like this and to um, meet people from um, times of work and to look at some of the really interesting uh, posters that were downstairs. Thank you for that. I want to put to you this afternoon the case for the law to be changed in the United Kingdom to allow mentally competent, terminally ill adults to have at their request the information, the support, and the means, and they need all three, to have an assisted death at the time of their choice, subject to certain safeguards. I've come to support a change in the law after working in palliative medicine for 20 odd years and meeting, as we all do, that small but significant cohort of people for whom an assisted death would have been the preferred outcome to their illness. And of course, it would also have been the most compassionate outcome to their illness. I must declare an interest here. I have faced a life-threatening disease. Eight years ago, I was found to have a malignant tumor in a kidney and the prognostic signs were not good. I fully expected to die. I sorted out my affairs and I planned and wrote my funeral. I can tell you it was a sobering experience. But it taught me many things about myself. Not the least, 
that when I do face a terminal illness, I would want the option of an assisted death for myself. But perhaps more important, it taught me that even after 20 years as a palliative care doctor, I did not fully appreciate the depth, the complexity, and the pain of the emotion of facing a terminal illness. Now, you will notice that I call the process assisted dying. I don't really think it matters what we end up calling it, but I do think we need to clearly define what we mean by the terms that we use in the debate to avoid misunderstanding. So I want to point out to you that I am not talking about euthanasia, where a third person ends the life of the individual, either at their request or otherwise. But I also want to say that I'm not talking about suicide. Suicide is a dreadfully destructive act done in a moment of despair. Destructive for the individual, of course, but also dreadfully destructive for their family who live with that and the consequences of that for the rest of their life. Assisted dying is a completely different thing. It is a considered act done rationally after thought and discussion. That is not to say, though, that it is without sadness. No one wants to die. Those who choose assisted dying would much rather choose to go on living. They still value their life. They still love their families. But for them, the experience of suffering the dying process becomes unendurable. And that suffering cannot be overcome no matter what the quantity nor what has to be said, the quality of the palliative care that can be offered them. And it is faced with that distressing, painful, unendurable suffering that they would rather choose to die prematurely than to go on. Currently, facing a death from a terminal illness, one has five options other than to allow the natural course of the illness, none of which are terribly satisfactory. The first is you can choose to refuse all life-sustaining treatment. The second, and this is extraordinarily difficult to do, you can voluntarily stop eating and drinking. Neither of these two will, of course, necessarily deliver a death in the required time frame. The third is that you could end your own life. And we have to just stop for a minute and talk about this because, in fact, it often comes up. In fact, I was in a debate last night and somebody glibly said, well, they can commit suicide, can't they? It's not against the law. The fact is that most people don't know what to take, nor in what quantity to take it, to ensure a peaceful, dignified death. It's about that information and the support, not just the means. Of course, you can expect that people might want to do something or go and do something violent, like jump off a building or under a train. But when I was ill, I have to say, those were the most frightening thoughts I had, and I don't think in a civilised society we should be encouraging people to have them. You can hope that your GP or another healthcare professional will help you to die, but given that obviously it's illegal and the consequences if they were found out are pretty horrendous for them, that's unlikely to occur. And finally, you can go, as we've heard, to Dignitas in Switzerland. That's not without its problems. It's a, expensive to join and to travel, I'm told, you don't get much change out of £10,000. More important in my mind is you have to be fit enough to travel, and as Debbie Purdy made the point, that means going much earlier in the disease process and dying much sooner than one would choose to. And finally, of course, one has to die away from home and possibly alone, or if friends and family go with you, they face on their return at least a police investigation if not a prosecution for aiding a suicide. How many, we may ask, individuals in the United Kingdom suffer this unendurable distress every year? The sad fact is that we don't actually know because those kind of statistics are not kept. The data from Oregon shows that 0.2% of all deaths occur from assisted dying. And that equates to about 1,000 deaths a year in the United Kingdom. Or we'll put another way, there are currently a thousand people a year suffering unendurably in the United Kingdom at the end of their lives. That's about 10 times the number of people that are in this room this afternoon. Just have a look around 
and get a picture in your head. It's a small number in percentage terms, but a big number in terms of distress and suffering. Another important point to make is that all of those five options do occur without any particular safeguard. An investigation into a death that occurs through one of those five options obviously occurs after the individual has died. When the individual reaches the point where their suffering is so unendurable that they would rather die, this places us, our society, in a dilemma. We find we have two con values in conflict. On the one hand, we value comfort and don't wish to see the individual suffer. And on the other hand, we value life and don't wish to see anybody die prematurely. So we can either say to these people, as in fact we do at the moment, sorry, you just have to suffer, or we can take a compassionate route and make provision for their assisted death. Such legislation, which would be based on that used in Oregon and the United States, where the Death with Dignity Act has now been in force for 18 years, gives the initiative to the individual. This is about individual choice. The individual needs to make the choice, initiate the process, and if their application is approved, needs to take the lethal medication themselves. Just a brief word about possible benefits and risks and a change in the law. The most obvious benefit is obviously the reduction of distress and suffering of those individuals who would choose this way out. I would argue that we should change the law now to reduce the considerable suffering of those 1,000 people alone. But two points to make. Last night I was debating with Peter Saunders and he argued that 3,000 deaths would result from a change in the law. He hasn't answered my email yet to tell me where he got that figure from. But I would argue that makes it even more important for us to change the law if it's as many as 3,000. But what is also interesting is that in Oregon, only about 60% of the people who actually have their application granted end up taking the medication. The other 40% die naturally, which means, of course, that once they have the medication, they can go on seeing how they manage to get through and find often that they do get to a natural death. This would equate to another five or 600 people in the United Kingdom having that security of knowing that if things got unbearable, they would have a way out. And of course, many more would take comfort from the fact that the system allows for an assisted death, and that alone would be sufficient comfort for them, a kind of insurance policy. But equally, I would argue it's important that we recognize the benefits of the safeguards that a change in the law would introduce, which would be an improvement on our current system, which we've noted a number of deaths can occur without safeguards. The application and assessment process for an assisted death obviously must be robust, but at the same time it needs to be affordable and time of timely and user-friendly. It would be no help to have a process that is so onerous that anyone who wanted an assisted death died long before the process could be completed. But the important thing about that process is that if there is a suspicion about a person being depressed or acting under duress, then this can be addressed while the person is alive, not after they have died. We have much of the potential risks to our society, and obviously we need to consider those. We have the added advantage in the United Kingdom that there are now 18, laws of, 18 years of practice of the law being in operation in Oregon. So we can look there to see what evidence there is that these risks have been occurring. And broadly, I think risks fall into four categories. The first, and I would argue probably the most important, is that there should be no abuse. And in particular, that the vulnerable shouldn't be abused. In fact, it's very interesting that the figures coming out of Oregon show that there's a considerable underrepresentation of people who would be defined as vulnerable. As an aside, it's also interesting to note that it doesn't appear to be driven by economy because 96% of of those who have an assisted death have insurance, not an, an inconsiderable consideration in the United States. The second risk is that, that changing the law would set us on a slippery slope. Now, of course, you need to define what you mean by slippery slope. But again, the evidence from Oregon doesn't seem to indicate that any of the current definitions that I can find are happening. The numbers of assisted deaths are not escalating out of control. They have risen over the years, but they are pretty stable. There's no evidence of doctors or nurses behaving irrationally and killing everybody that moves. And there's no evidence of escalating unreasonable demands for a change in the law. 
A third area of concern is that, that will, a change in the law would lead to an erosion of trust in doctors by the public. In fact, the opposite is true. The trust between doctor and patient is highest across Europe in the Netherlands. It seems as I think we should expect from our experience in palliative care that talking openly and honestly about an issue actually increases the trust of the public and healthcare professionals, not the opposite. And finally, there's the concern about unintended consequences of a change in the law. Obviously, nobody could stand here and say there will never be an unintended consequence. But again, the evidence from places that have changed their law is that none have really occurred. And I can see no reason why we should be different. Even the one that was suggested to me last night that somehow a change in the law has an invidious depreciation of the value of every individual in the country and thereby raises the chances of the rest of us committing suicide. I have to say, listening to um, the previous speaker, that um, I take comfort from the fact that it is easier to oppose social change than to advocate for it. And if you look back at the great social changes that have occurred in the last two centuries, um, many of them have taken many years to, uh, to argue for, to get them to be t passed through Parliament. But finally, I want to just say something specifically about hospices. I've got a couple more minutes because obviously that's very close to my heart. I just want to say a couple of things about the Oregon Hospice Association. They and their CEO at the time, Anne Jackson, were very opposed to a change in the law there and vigorously opposed it. Both have since changed their minds. The OHA, at the time that the law was passed, um, went to the courts to try and have court ruling against it, and the law being what it is, it took quite a long time, and by the time it got there, the law had been in operation for some years, and they withdrew because they argued that, in fact, the concerns they had had not appeared um, in practice. And Anne Jackson has now gone on record that she actually supports the ODDA. And their change of attitude occurred for three reasons. They saw the improvements in discussion that occurred as a result of the acts being passed. They saw the comfort that knowing the act was there gave to even those who didn't pursue an application for assisted dying. And perhaps most important, they saw that when palliative care could not relieve the distress of the individual, that individual had a safe and supported way out. But of course, the other point to make is that assisted dying has not had a negative impact on palliative care in Oregon. Interestingly, now that according to the EAPC, has it done so in Europe, although the ch changes in the law in Europe I recognize are very different. In fact, the consensus is that palliative care has probably um, improved, and again, that is about being able to respond openly for requests to help to dying, and patients not being deterred by the, law, by the law from expressing their concerns and wishes. I want to just think briefly about an imaginary case study. I want you to imagine that assisted dying is legal and that you're caring for a man, let's make him 65, with multiple bone mets from a renal cell cancer that's resulted in a spinal cord compression and he's married with no children, and he's in your hospice for, for pain control, which is reasonably well controlled. You've been quite successful. But his main distress is that he's fecally incontinent, and he finds that constant problem overwhelming. And he tells you that he's decided that he would like to consider to have an assisted death. We assume that you and your team have offered him the appropriate palliative care and support, but his application for assisted dying is successful. However, he's anxious about going home and taking the lethal medication there and what effect that would have on his wife. And he would like to take it in the hospice where he feels safe with your care and support. What would you do? Or put another way, what is the best outcome for this man? 
I try to think of this not in the abstract, but he's, you know, like the man in bedroom number three down at the end of the corridor. Who would be better to support and care for this man and his family through his assisted death than the hospice staff with all their expertise and skill? Would we seriously say to him, we don't agree with this, you must go somewhere else? To those who fear what our supporters would say, I ask, what message does our withdrawal of care and support give about our service? There's a lot we could say about that, and I hope we'll come back and talk about it. But it should obviously go without saying that I would want to see individuals who choose an assisted death to be able to have that in their hospice, if that is their wish, or at home with the support of a palliative care team, if that is their wish. Hospices have placed great emphasis on the values of choice and autonomy and empowerment. Rightly so, I believe. Why should assisted dying be different? This is the most important point I would make. We are not talking about palliative care or assisted dying, but rather palliative care and assisted dying. Assisted dying should be a choice within palliative care. Everyone who comes to the end of their life will need good palliative care. A small percentage of those will find their suffering, the dying process becomes unendurable, and they will choose assisted dying but they too will need the support and care that I believe only palliative care can offer to help them make that decision and to die the gentle, dignified death that we all desire for all our patients and indeed for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard.